Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's Gopher Solutions webinar. My name is Tabor Swatsky. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, this is a monthly webinar focusing on a variety of physical education subjects and topics. Past webinar topics have included PE teachers presenting on spe specific activities like assessment, fitness, classroom management, and PE advocacy. Past presenters have included Dr. Robert Pangrazy, Dr. John Medina, and Jean Blades. Our presenters have done a great job of bringing useful topics and information to the field of physical education. Our webinars will almost always occur the third week of the month. All attendees of today's webinar will receive a certificate of participation for one hour of educational credit. Also today, all attendees will be entered to win the Active Academics Cross-Curricular Shoot. This parachute includes the entire alphabet and 32 numbers printed on the 16 panels. The triple stitched edge has a half inch rope sewn into it for easy grip and the parachute also includes a lesson guide and is valued at $289. Today's webinar is titled Cross-Curricular Fit, a fresh approach to integrating core content in physical education with Chad Triolet. Before I introduce Chad, I wanted to mention that you will have the chance to ask questions during the presentation. Your questions are only visible to me, the moderator, so feel free to ask any questions you might have during the presentation. Questions can be typed into the questions area on the right side of your screen at any time during the webinar. We'll accumulate questions throughout the presentation and we'll have a chance to address your questions with Chad at the end of the presentation. Today I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter, Chad Triolet. Chad is currently serving as the Safe Routes to School Coordinator for Chesapeake Public Schools in Chesapeake, Virginia. He has 18 years teaching experience as an elementary physical educator in the district. As a physical educator, he took great pride in offering a high quality physical education program that focused on teaching the whole child. Chad utilized a variety of creative strategies and techniques to help students raise fitness levels and to learn and practice critical movement skills and concepts that promote living and active lifestyle. Along the way, he incorporated core academic content, character education, and team building concepts to help reinforce learning and build skills, skills that students will need for a lifetime of success. Chad has also had many opportunities to present and share ideas throughout the state of Virginia and beyond. Over the past decade, he has presented in 22 states in Canada. His presentations focus on best practices in physical education and include a variety of subjects, incorporating core standards of learning and physical education, instant activities that get students up and moving, large group activities, practical exer gaming for PE, Omnican games, moving to the beat, dance and PE, IPE, creative technology solutions for health and PE, and noodle mania. He is a certified Bike Smart Virginia instructor and holds a master's in educational leadership. On a more personal level, Chad has been happily married for 14 years to his amazing and supportive wife, Amy, and he is the father of three wonderful children, Bella, Alex, and Drew. At this time, I will turn it over to our presenter, Chad. Chad, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Tabor. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, from uh, you and Gopher to, uh, for hosting this webinar. I hope that all the attendees uh, will be able to take away some useful ideas uh, and th during this time of the year when many of us, uh, many of the schools are doing standardized testing, uh, maybe you can help uh, your students be a little bit more successful with some of these ideas. So we're going to get rolling along uh, real quickly here and the first thing we're going to start with is a quick uh, poll for the audience. So if you uh, would take about 30 to 40 seconds, it's going to shut down in 30 to 40 seconds, uh, select uh, what level you teach, elementary, middle, or high, which is most applicable for what you do on a daily basis. I'm just trying to figure out who my audience is today. So if you have a second, go ahead and quickly start selecting one, and you're either picking A for elementary, B for middle, or C for high school. We're going to keep rolling right along and move right into the content and uh, cross-curricular fit. Uh, why cross-curricular fit? Well, uh, there's a, a couple of reasons that I chose this topic um, or chose this title, if you will. Uh, CrossFit is a highly popular training method that uh, hundreds of thousands of adults and kids are doing every day. Uh, some of you may have heard of CrossFit. Uh, it is quite popular. Um, the training for CrossFit is 
constantly varied, uses functional movements, and has high intensity. For the cross-curricular fit concept, um, the concept, the content in this case would be very varied. Um, so I, I think that there are some parallels here. Um, and it would be very, very based on the need that your students have and the time of the year that you're teaching uh, because some content may be covered at different times of the year. Um, we're going to be using, like CrossFit that uses functional movements, we're going to be using functional academic skills. We're using the foundational skills, the bottom uh, of the barrel, I guess, if you would say, when we're looking at Bloom's taxonomy, we're looking at sort of like the foundation for learning, uh, the recall, um, the identifying, in most cases because it's quick and easy, and we're still reinforcing concepts. Uh, we just may not be at the higher level of Bloom's because of the time that we have available to us. Um, and the last part, that aligns with um, high intensity is that uh, w the content that we're going to be talking about is intense because we're going to be both engaging our physical selves and our mental selves at the same time. So I'm kind of maybe bridging a few gaps here um, and maybe reaching a little bit, but I kind of felt like CrossFit had some nice tie-ins with the concept of uh, interdisciplinary instruction. Um, if you take a look at the slide, you'll notice that the things that I'm really focusing on here are just creative ways to integrate the content, not the, not maybe the rote um, repetition, uh, but, but some other ways to integrate. And there are great ways to integrate by using like multiplication tables when kids are counting back and forth. Those are great solutions, but there are other creative ways to add content. Um, I want to make sure that everyone is aware that I've, in a physical education teacher, first content Core content is very important, but I have standards that I need to meet as a physical education teacher, and I don't believe that in doing any of this, supporting the core content, that we should be sacrificing um, skills or fitness to do so. And the last thing is that your job, your role with core content is not to teach it. Your, that's not your primary role. Your job is to reinforce. So you need to find out what the information uh, they're going to be talking about in the classes, classroom, and then get the basic vocabulary and reinforce it in some creative way. All right, so why, why does this make sense? Well, take a look at the research. Um, everyone, um, you've, you've probably seen this diagram of the learning pyramid. Uh, physical education provides schools with an excellent means to increase learning by promoting hands-on learning opportunities regarding academic concepts. If you'll notice here, where we talked about earlier, Bloom's taxonomy, we were maybe at the bottom level, we are now going to be a little bit more interactive when the students are learning. So the retention of the material that you're going to be sharing is going to stay with them longer. Um, so you're going to be doing a lot of discussion with them where maybe they might be sharing pair, pair and share activities or where they're working with each other collaboratively to accomplish a goal or sort information. Um, they're going to get practice. They're going to be hands-on. The whole idea behind physical education is, is to be hands-on. And then in the process of doing this, you might find out that students, some students um, know the material really well, and you might pair them with students who don't know the material very well, and then therefore now we're hitting the, the top end of that. Um, learning pyramid. There's also a little bit more research on, on the brain and how it works um, when we talk about being physically active. Um, as physical education teachers, uh, you already should be familiar with the fact that um, when we get kids up and moving, we're increasing blood flow to the brain, and by increasing, increasing that blood flow um, and getting them physically active, we're increasing their attention levels, really important if they're trying to learn. Um, creative activities that are novel and um, help students develop strong neural pathways to remember concepts. The brain loves novelty, so teaching it in a classroom and then re, uh, reinforcing it in a different way through physical education is novel and helps kids make connections a little bit differently. <laughs> Uh, concrete experiences are those hands-on experiences. Sometimes they sit in classrooms and they have to think of abstract concepts, but if I can get them to manipulate, uh, use manipulatives to build something or to create something or to count something, then those hands-on concrete experiences are really important for that brain to process information and be able to retain it. And the last one is what we do in physical education all the time is really great for the brain. We know that, that the brain is very social. We provide an environment in physical education that 
promotes learning because we're interactive. We do communication, collaboration. So it's all those 21st century skills. We do it all the time in physical education, but we forget to remember to tell people how important that is for student learning. Now, with that in mind, we want to move on to what kind of content that we can, we can embed in our physical education uh, lessons. Most people think of the big four, English, language, arts being one. Uh, we've got your, your old math, science, and social studies, but I also think that in integrating health content is very, very important, and um, doing it in a, a team-building way also is very beneficial to students. Um, the key to success is finding the content that makes sense for you and for your students. Some of the content that they may be weak in will not be a natural fit for physical education, and that's okay. Um, but there will be other things that you can do to promote uh, uh, promote learning and supporting academics um, in physical education. For me, I'm very fortunate that my wife is a fifth grade teacher. I've been using her as a resource for years, but when it came to finding out what our needs were for third grade, she didn't have that content expertise, so I had to reach out into my building. So I really, really suggest that you take the time when you're doing um, adding content is to talk to classroom teachers. They really do have some creative solutions or things that you would never think of. Oh, well, I never thought of that vocabulary before. Yeah, I could, I could work that in. Um, and so we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go through. And you'll see what I'm talking about because a lot of the activities that, that we're going to talk about a little bit later um, were derived from ideas that my wife or other classroom teachers kind of helped me build. All right, here's the other participant poll. Um, and integrating uh, academic content is, is certainly not a new concept, especially with high stakes testing. Schools are looking for more ways to help students uh, learn state standards. So I'm curious, you got about 30 to 40 seconds, so quickly get going on this one. How often are you currently integrating either health or other academic content in your physical education classes? Are you doing it every day? A, most of the time. B, half of the time less than half of the time, or never. All right, so we're going to keep rolling right along, and we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing once we get going, because uh, we're short on time, and this will go by quickly, I'm sure. All right, so uh, let's talk about some simple ways to embed uh, some core content. Some of the, these things you may already be using, and I hope that you are, um, but we'll talk a little bit, hopefully, about some, some creative ways to do that. To, to integrate these in a second. So if you take a look on the screen, you're going to notice we've got flashcards, playing cards, random number generators, and vocabulary cards. And I have to talk a little quick second about my story behind, oh, wow, about half the people uh, never, no, no, half the people didn't answer. Okay, so um, let's look at that poll. I'm looking at the poll, sorry. Um, I'm a little scatterbrained right now. Uh, less than half of the time is the largest majority, okay? So hopefully we'll give you some quick ways that you are, you're able to do it um, based on what we talked about today. Um, and it's really important, too, that when we say that less than half the time, I think you may be in the discussions that we have today, find that you actually are integrating it, you just didn't think of it in terms of that. So um, when we talk about number generators, uh, when I first started teaching my first year, I did a lesson and I incorporated the, uh, random number generators, also known as dice. And uh, when I did it, I was doing a math activity as a warm-up, as part of my warm-up, and the kids were rolling the dice, and they were, we were talking about dice, and they were very engaged, and it was great. And my principal, after I got done, we went and had my, my uh, post-observation discussion, and she said, you know, you did a great job, Mr. Triole, you're, you're doing a fantastic job as a new teacher, but I will, will, will warn you that you're not allowed to call those dice. And I said, why not? And she said, well, because dice is associated with gambling. Um, and I said, uh, okay. I said, well, then what do we call them? And hence the name number generators. In my public school division, I have been instructed to never call them dice. They're number generators. I always ask the kids every year that I've ever taught if I had the dice out. I said, hey, guys, what are these? They always said dice. Um, so anyway, uh, moving on. So flashcards are very useful for doing basic math math skills, uh, adding, subtracting, multiplication tables. You can put those out at stations where you have task cards and then the kid pull, a student pulls up a card, does the math on it, and that gives them the number of the fitness activities they're going to do. Playing cards are great because playing cards can be used for students to use a chart. 
So you put up the different, uh, sh the different uh, suits and now you've created a chart. And so now that's what's telling the students what activity they're going to do for their warm up. Um, whether it's a, the spades are going to be doing jumping jacks and the hearts will be doing, you know, cross crawls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, random, num random number generators are great because you can do math with them. You can add, you can subtract, you can, um, you can have them randomly decide what station they're going to go to. So now we're talking about probability. So there's lots of really good things there. And then my favorite one are vocabulary cards because I've kind of come up with a interesting way to use a vocabulary card. We do it based on content, but if they're going to use it as uh, something to tell them how many of an activity they're going to do, it's based on the number of letters that are in the word. So if I pick up the card, the Celsius card, and I learned that's a unit of temperature measurement, um, then I um, check, check my answer, and then I count the number of letters in Celsius, which is seven, then I do seven jumping jacks. So that's just another way to use that as a tool to help you do fitness, but also um, work on their vocabulary at the same time. Two birds, one stone. Now the next two ideas are relative, or I guess are a little bit newer. I was trying to come up with creative ways to get more focused content. So um, the card on the left we designed um, based on um, what students need to know for their standards test. Um, the example that I have here is a line plot. And the line plot is something that the students are seeing a lot more on their assessments. Um, and we've noticed this in benchmarking. So what we've tried to do is create a line plot that was health and physical education content. So we're talking about soccer, soccer goals. And um, the answer that they give will be the number of whatever they they are doing for their fitness activity. So that might be at a station, again, with a task card of uh, crab kicks. And the students will look at this line plot. They might have a partner and they're working collaboratively and they see, okay, how many goals were scored? Well, in this case, 10 goals were scored by the group. Uh, I mean, 10 students scored a goal. And so therefore, um, the, the students at that station would do 10 crab kicks and they would move on and then have another uh, similarly uh, similar looking uh, but different content perhaps uh, task card at another station or another task uh, at another um, location for their fitness. Money task cards are, are uh, one of my favorites uh, to, to use because um, number one, they need to be able to, to know how to add uh, coins. They also need to be able to recognize what coin is what. Um, and for our younger gay, gay, uh, grades, they just have to identify what what uh, coins they see, perhaps, and what the value is. Older students can start adding up the value. And then we do activities where if they complete a task, like if they're doing jump rope, uh, that they were jumping a long rope, um, when they complete 10 jumps in a row, they can come and get a, a money card. And then their team tries to collect as, much money as many money cards as possible. And then they can sort the money cards by highest to lowest value. They could just try to single out and find the highest value out of all the ones they collected, or they could add them up as part of the activity. Um, and so now we're just reinforcing that money concept, and they love to do it because it's so different. They don't know what kind of, I hold them so they can't see what the value is, and I just give them a random card. It could be two pennies on the card, and they're like, oh, well, you got to do 10 more jumps, and then you might get $1. fifty. Who knows? And so it's randomized. It's a lot of fun for the kids, and, um, and it's a real just simple concept using tasks. Uh, task cards to drive, um, number one, motivating the students, but also using it as a tool uh, to help reinforce some concepts. All right, now earlier, we're going to, now we're going to talk a little bit about some creative ways to integrate um, these concepts kind of holistically and creatively. Um, since we mentioned CrossFit earlier in the presentation, here is a creative way to use the Tabata training protocol to integrate academic concepts. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Tabata, um, it was developed by Dr. Izumi Tabata, who was uh, working with the Japanese speed skating team, and he did a lot of research and found that in this four minutes of activity, you would be able to burn the same amount of calories in the 24-hour period than if you did a 30-minute uh, jog. So you could do get the same benefit in a four minute workout that you could for 30 minutes of jogging. I don't know about you, but um, I might vote for that four minutes uh, some of the, some days uh, when I'm really tired. 
So um, the exercise protocol is a four-minute interval that is comprises of eight 20-second work intervals with 10-second rest periods in between each of the work intervals. So on the slide, you can see, starting on the far left-hand side, the first interval for 20 seconds is going to be jogging in place. Now, a traditional Tabata is 100% of your um, effort for the 20 seconds. In physical education class, your kids may not be able to do that. Um, and if you're leading this and doing it with them, you do not want to do, you know, eight to ten Tabatas a day. It's not going to be good for you. So um, in this case, we would probably just kind of jog lightly in place. Maybe we were using this as the warm-up for the day. So we're jogging for uh, in place for 20 seconds, and then we take a 10-second rest where we do nothing. We just rest and breathe. The second interval is jumping jacks, but now every time we do a jumping jack, we're going to integrate the math concept. We're going to count by multiples of five. We move on, then we do, again, we take a break. We move on to cross crawls, where your elbow touches your knee in front of you, opposite knee to opposite elbow, and you're going to continue doing that. Again, if we're using this as a warm-up, we're kind of stretching while we're doing it, or you, um, trying to get uh, cross laterals, which is good for the brain, as we all know, as physical educators. And again, as you see, I have throughout this Tabata, I've integrated four different academic, basic academic concepts that they get to practice while they do um, the Tabata. So just a creative way to use the Tabata. Um, if you are using the Tabata, um, you can always go online to get more information about it. There's lots of really good uh, research on Tabatas and the benefits of using a Tabata. Uh, you can also go on to iTunes or Amazon and download uh, Tabata tunes so that they're already pre-selected. So they give you the work interval and the music changes for the rest interval and the music pops up again. So it's a really useful uh, to have that music uh, so you're not having to tell the kids when to stop and start, um, that they can do it using the music. All right, so here's another uh, creative way to get kids up and moving and integrate. Um, I like to use instant activities most of the time for these because, um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to sacrifice physical education content. I don't. Um, if there are ways during my activity that I can integrate the content, then great. Um, sorry about that. Um, I want to integrate the content uh, I can, but I really focus more of that in my warm-up activity. So this one's called Four Corner Fitness. The students are uh, moving around the track um, in a uh, clockwise direction. Each time they go to a new corner, they perform a fitness activity with, that's driven by a task card. So I'm not there standing, or I could just write something on a card. Jumping jacks don't need uh, directions. That every student knows what a jumping jack is. Um, and again, here's where I use those task cards, those random number generators, those playing cards to help my students know how many of the activities they're doing. This is a great opportunity to put in those uh, specific content task cards. Um, I don't try to put content task cards in every corner because sometimes they're time consuming to, to do. It's really important to note that there are, it's a double rectangle. The inner rectangle is where the students do the fitness activities. They do the fitness activities on the inside of the playing area. They move to, on the track um, from, from corner to corner so that they don't have a, a safety issue. Um, as the teacher, you can spread the track out. You can add more hoops. You can have students travel in various locomotor patterns from corner to corner. The possibilities are endless, and every time that you go, you can also target the fitness that you want. So let's say we're doing physical fitness testing. We find out that core strength isn't our thing. So now we design all four of these corners, our different core, um, core fitness activities. So we've targeted what we're doing based on what we've our data analysis, and now we've got that uh, going for us, too. So I love to use Four Corner Fitness to get the kids up and moving uh, as an instant activity. Uh, I am a big fan of tag games because uh, students get up and get moving. Um, as we're the younger students, have, we have to kind of work our way into tag games. Um, and as you can see from the slide, this is one of my favorite things uh, to use for tagging are noodle pieces. So um, this one, this particular activity is some health-related content. Um, we typically use this during our jump rope, jump rope unit because we tie into jump rope for heart and being heart healthy. 
And so in this, this tagging game, we're talking about the risk factors for heart disease. Um, we use six differently colored noodle pieces as the risk factors. Uh, prior to the activity start, starting, the students learn the acronym for uh, risk factor, uh, the, the risk factors for heart disease, which is O-DISH. Um, and you can see the list right there. Uh, I had a student teacher who uh, came up with that an ac uh, acronym for us, and we've used I've used it ever since. So thanks, David, for that. Um, and in this game, taggers tag below the knee. Um, and if you're tagged with a risk factor, you have to go to that color hula hoop that matches the color of the tag. So if I was tagged with a red noodle, I would go to the red hula hoop where I would have a obesity informational uh, task card, as well as a fitness activity to earn my way back into the game. Um, I really like to do games also where the taggers change. So in this game, uh, I call it the Hornet Tag version, where if you get tagged or stung in Hornet Tag, you drop your stinger. So in this game, if you tag somebody with a risk factor, you have to drop it, and you can search for another noodle piece and become a new risk factor, or someone else can come in. Uh, collect yours and become a new tagger. Kind of keeps the game moving and then you don't have uh, the game get bogged down by just having one tagger the entire time. Right. Next, um, I like to use these all of the time throughout the year um, and I'll select different things. Uh, two line activities are uh, a brilliant design. Um, it's just such a simple concept. It's two people facing off in the middle of your space uh, to do a challenge. Uh, in this particular case, I've given you some examples of ways to do two-line activities where you are working on academic skills. So if you have a content assessment and you find out from the teachers, hey, I'm doing, I want to do a true-false tag about Virginia history, and you give me some questions that I could ask the students that are true-false based on your content. And then one side, let's say the students that are on the left-hand side in the gym would be the trues, and the other side would be the falses, um, and you're going to ask the question, and if the answer is true, the trues will chase the falses before the falses can get to their, uh, their sideline. Um, if they're tagged, they get a point, the person gets a point, and then you come back to the middle, and then again. So they have to know the content answer correctly in order to be able to move to know who's the tagger and who's the taggy. Same thing with rock, paper, scissors, math. Um, we do uh, traditional rock, paper, scissors with one uh, hand on top of the open palm. When they show the fingers, they're going to add them up. So for primary ages, we just add them up. So if I had two, two fingers out and someone else had three fingers out, we could add them up for a total of five. If I yell out five, then I become the tagger and I can try to tag for bonus points. Um, odd and even tag, again, uh, odd and even tag a lot of times I did with the random number generators. I would roll the random number generators, and if you were an odd and the odds popped up, then they would get the tag, if it was an even, and that way the kids understand the basic concept for odd and even, verbs and nouns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can do a thousand different activities doing two line, um, using two, the two line concept. We used it for basketball, we used it for football, we did it for everything that we, we could. I just I love two-line activities. They're real simple, um, and you can use it a billion ways. All right, we're going to keep moving on to another uh, health-related concept, maybe. There it is, uh, noodle soup, another one of the crazy noodle activities that I like to do with kids. Um, in this, we're basically, con the concept is to work on a nutrition activity. We uh, have crazy chefs who are defending their kitchen and don't want to share their food. That's really not a nice concept, but they're crazy, so that's why they're the crazy chefs. The crazy chefs must stay inside the kitchen, and they can only tag someone who goes into the kitchen to try to, to uh, get some food out. Um, there are small teams on the outside that are working collaboratively to come in and get the food and get out. Um, and the whole idea is to create a balanced meal, um, and we like to call them my plate meals. So they're trying to get one food from each of the five categories to make their my plate meals. And here is a little diagram of what it might look like if you were doing it. You've got the crazy chefs in the center in the kitchen. Uh, the food would be in large hula hoops. You can use I use pool noodles for the food, um, and each of the colors of the pool noodles represents each of the categories. Uh, so red for fruit, green for vegetables, et cetera. 
or you c can use the nutrition cards. You can put nutrition cards in there, and now they have, you know, then they can look and see what the calories are, all kinds of cool stuff to do there. Um, and on the outside, you see the basket. The teams would be together at a basket and then try to collect their food in the basket. And then at the end of the game is when you try to build your my plates, and then you, all the kids get out and they work together, and they try to see how many complete my plates they can build. So this requires a lot of collaboration and communication in order to make sure that you don't get too much fruit because at the end of the game, if I have 10 fruits but I only have five vegetables, I'm only ever going to be able to make at the most five complete my plates because I only have five vegetables. So this is a great opportunity for kids to look, work together and communicate. Please remember if you're doing any kind of activity like this to maximize the kids that are participating and moving. Um, if you do larger groups, have more than one student go at a time. I like to use um, flags, football flags, for my runners. And if I had a group of four, I would have at least two people who could run out and collect at any one time. Uh, hold on a second. Got a little uh, issue there. Sorry. Um, I'm keep, keep rolling. That's the best part about these webinars. You never know what's going to happen. All right, so noodle soup, pretty uh, interesting concept. We're going to keep on rolling. Uh, save Jamestown, I mentioned earlier about um, making uh, decisions based on um, what your your teachers are able to share with you. Um, our, one of the things, if you're from Virginia, you know that Jamestown is the, like, so they spend the whole year talking about Jamestown. Fortunately, we live very close to Jamestown, um, and so our kids learn, get to learn a lot about it. Um, but we found that our students were having trouble really connecting with Jamestown, so we wanted to come up with a way for them to better understand what the colonists were go going through. So we came up with Save Jamestown, which is a simple tagging game. Um, and in this this game, um, you can integrate sports skills, um, and you can also change the game, use the basic concept, but just now use different content. So, uh, for example, in this game you have um, – they need to find out what the challenges the colonists are going to face. So the taggers in this game would be the the challenges that a colonist was faced. For example, uh, they were they put their settlement down near brackish water, so they didn't have fresh cleaning water. They had a big fire. Uh, they had lots of disease because of the mosquitoes. Uh, they had um, lack of farming knowledge. So there were a lot of challenges for the Jamestown colonists, and so that's what those people who are the taggers, uh, again, my favorite, the pool noodle, um, is going to represent. Now, in this game, if you're tagged, you go to outside the playing area, and when you're standing outside the playing area, you're going to do a physical activity until someone with knowledge can come and save you. Because it was really important for, it's really important for our students to make the connection that the only reason that Jamestown survived was because of, that's right, the Native Americans. So the Native Americans came to aid uh, the colonists, and so they imparted knowledge on how to farm, how to avoid disease, how to treat the disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in this version, we have a person who is imparting knowledge with somebody else, and I like to use basketballs for this game, to be perfectly honest. Um, those people who are the Native Americans are dribbling basketballs and will go save somebody else. They'll go over to outside our playing area, and they'll pass the ball back and forth seven times doing bounce passes. On the seventh pass, the person who was the colonist now becomes empowered with knowledge and becomes the new Native American and can go save somebody else. So the game rotates around, um, and it gives the, the students an opportunity to connect with what the challenges were in a really creative and fun and easy way. And last but not least, we're going to integrate some science. Uh, this is, we're talking about habitats. Uh, this is a big subject uh, that, that is covered on our third grade standards test. Well, actually, they don't do that anymore, so I guess it'll be covered on the fifth grade science test. That's awesome that they get to go uh, five years and then get to use all that content for one test. Boy, that's smart, isn't it? So let's move on. Um, in this game, we usually typically play with with uh, scooter boards, and my students would come in and we would talk about what is a habitat. They would give me examples of a habitat, and then we would talk about all kinds of things that they need to know, uh, language like uh, 
predators, prey, et cetera, et cetera, and their object is to survive, a, uh, to survive by getting across to the coral reef, because I like to make this a, a fishy game, and on the other side of the cones would be the coral reef where all of our food is, and the students try to swim on the scooter boards across to the other side without being tagged by the predators. Now, your predators can change depending on what kind of um, habitat you're choosing. If I'm in the ocean, my students will choose a barracuda, they'll choose a shark, they'll choose all kinds of things, um, and I let them make that choice. Um, and if you're tagged by one of those predators, then you have to put your food back uh, if you did collect it, or if you didn't, you come back and let somebody else from your team go. Again, it's really important to have lots of scooter boards here so you have lots of kids going. Um, we also have bases or places where the fish can hide along the way. So if I'm hiding on a cone with my hand on the cone, then the predator can't get me. Uh, but it's really important that you only allow one prey on a base or cone at a time, uh, because otherwise it'll just get, the game will just become bogged down. Um, and the other reason that we want to have multiple kids from a team going is because if you don't have more than one and you only have one scooter board and that student is stuck on the, on the base, then the other kids in the group aren't going, and that's not a whole lot of fun. So giving them multiple opportunities. Now, you don't have to play this on scooter boards. You can play this outside. I've done it a thousand times outside where they're running across the field. Um, but again, the whole con concept is, again, it was, a, it was a game that I was already doing. I don't even remember what we called it. And then I was like, well, gosh, this, we could add content to this. And so we just did. Um, and it worked out great. So, um, you know, another way to, to add content that's really simple is just name your teams after things that they need to know. You, you, uh, it's a, it's a f famous American bowling, and one team in the bowling game is uh, the, the uh, George Washingtons, and the other team in the bowling game is the uh, Abraham Lincolns. That's it. I mean, it's a really simple concept um, to do and, and a way to integrate, um, but again, we want kids to hear the vocabulary. We want to hear the vocabulary. Um, that, that they hear the content, the vocabulary is the right vocabulary. So checking with your teachers to make sure that the content is right is really important. Um, there's lots of ways to do experiments and use the terms hypothesis and uh, experimentation and uh, all of the things that the students need to know for science um, in that way. All right, so I hope that I gave you some, some food for thought. I hope that you chimed in with some questions. And so right now we're going to turn it over to Tabor for some questions. All right, thanks a lot, Chad. Um, yeah, and just to remind everybody in our audience, uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, you can log questions um, at any time <clears throat> throughout this question and answer period, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. I'm the only one who can see those questions, so feel free to type in any questions you might have. Uh, one of the first questions that I want to address that we get um, during these webinars is, will this presentation be available? And it will be available. All of our past webinars are available on our website. Um, you'll get an email when that is um, up and running to the email address that you use to register for the webinar. So we will make uh, the presentation available to all of our attendees. Um, Chad, first question is, um, you mentioned checking in with teachers on the content. Um, can you get into that a little bit more as to how you do that? Do you um, go to the lead teacher at the grade level? Um, do you invite them to, down to the gym? How do you collaborate with those teachers to get on board with um, content? Well, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that our school district has moved to is uh, professional learning communities, and this is that opportunity where, as a resource teacher, um, we are able to go out and meet with the individual groups of teachers. So um, typically what we would do is identify maybe once a month or twice a month where we would kind of split up and go and see if there was any content that the third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade, um, since those are our testing grades, um, needed for us to help reinforce. You know, some things are going to be, as I mentioned, are going to be a natural fit. Other things are going to be a little bit more challenged. Um, are going to be a little bit more challenging to integrate in uh, a way that's evasive, that's not evasive to your physical education program. You know, uh, vocabulary for me was always pretty easy to integrate because I would come up, like, we came up with a, the solution for, you know, if we did photosynthesis, the students would have to pick up the card, but then that card told them how many by counting the letters in the word photosynthesis. So, um, you know, you have to, whatever the system that your school has, um, you know, if you have common planning time, meeting time, 
Uh, Tabor mentioned your lead teacher in each grade level, your grade level chairperson. They're usually a very good source for information. You know, they, there are bad times to, to go in and ask those questions, and there are better times. Uh, you kind of have to feel that out, and you have to know your faculty. And honestly, as a physical education teacher who typically works with your entire faculty, um, it, it's pretty easy to identify people who are going to be able to help you. Right, right. Any feedback that you can give the group as to the kind of the response that you've had? I know you've been doing this for a little while, but the response you've had from teachers, I'd imagine that um, you know they're they're not used to probably a PE teacher at first coming to them and saying, "Hey, I'd like to reinforce some of the academics you're doing in our PE class." Um, anything you can share with the group as far as response to that? Um, at any time I've ever asked that, that I've. The teachers have been over backwards to give me. I, in fact, I've gotten more information than I ever needed to know um, in many cases. Uh, but they really, uh, the one thing that I have noticed is that they really appreciate the effort um, that, that I am cognizant, to, that I realize that um, this is a, a, a whole school effort to help educate kids, um, that we're all working together to help them be successful. Um, no matter where they are and what they're doing, and we want to help um, improve achievement and just being able to to reach out and for them to see the ways that I've integrated it too, sometimes for them has been like, gosh, why I could do this in the classroom too. So I think that was the best part. Uh, and I'll speak a little quick story. Um, several years ago, I was doing I was actually doing a heart rate experiment with the kids. So the kids had to come up with a hypothesis. I got a, a teacher from each grade level, third, fourth, and fifth, to give me all of the experimentation vocabulary that the kids would need to know. And I had a little chart, and so I'm trying to hit all of those those points with the kids as they're doing a heart rate experiment. And they had to pick which physical activity raised the heart the highest, and then they had to tell me why. And we had this whole thing. Well. A teacher came in early that normally never came into PE early, and she watched what I was doing and listened to me, and she was like, I had no idea what you did in PE, and this was the best thing. Everybody should see this. And that really made me feel like I was um, a lot more valued. Yeah. Um, but I was doing something that I, I felt was necessary for my kids to understand the concept of heart rate, but it also aligned very nicely with the, the scientific uh, standards. Yeah. That's uh... – that's cool. Um, kind of a, you know, the, to reciprocate the asking teachers for what you'd like to reinforce for, from a content standpoint, question is, um, has that opened up any doors for you to offer classroom teachers um, ways to include physical activity in their classrooms? Uh, this is a fantastic question. Uh, yes, absolutely, 100%. I think um, when they realize the value that you bring. Um, it gives you, opening that door gives you an opportunity to get in their ear. I mentioned earlier in the presentation about, you know, how we know as physical educators, uh, how we can have, it, how what we do has an impact on student learning. Classroom teachers typically aren't aware. So anytime you can open up a conversation and say, well, did you know, and mention those things, sometimes, like I said, they see you do something and they were like, oh, well, I could do rock, paper, scissors, math. That would be a great way for them to get up out of their chairs when we're doing some, you know, when we're doing a transition. Mm -hmm. Bingo. That's exactly what we want. Good. Um, question about assessing student knowledge throughout your class. Um, do you do you worry about that or is it some is it enough to just reinforce the content or do you do some assessment from a knowledge standpoint with what you're reinforcing? Uh, typically when and when I'm reinforcing a concept like that, I am not doing a formal assessment. That's not my role. My role right. is to make sure that they have the, the, the PE standards covered. So but what I really like to do is did they get it and I get that in my closure. I talk to the kids and I'll say, All right, so today we talked about um, an experiment. So give me some vocabulary that we talked about today and the kids will tell me. And it's it's great to see how they, you know, they connect with it and they get it. Um, you know, sometimes if I'm doing just a multiplication counting back and forth, you know, how am I going to assess that at the end of the class? I, I'm really working right. on basketball passing, <laughs> but I'm folding that information in there as well. But if there's something that I'm really, really trying to hit or I'm trying to get certain pieces of information, like in, say, save Jamestown, I, I really don't have the time as a physical educator to, to assess somebody else's content. I, if I can just fold it in in a game situation, then I feel like it's a win-win for everybody. Good. Um, a question about the cards that you mentioned in your presentation. 
Um, do you develop those cards, or are they available commercially? Uh, they are not developed uh, commercially. I make all of the cards myself. Um, I don't know. Uh, we didn't talk about this before, Tabor, before the, the webinar, but uh, when I did my webinar last year, I also had a bunch of game activities in there. I am willing right. to put together a handout that can also be posted on the Gopher website if that is okay with you. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, let's do that. And it's, I imagine those cards, um, you know, that – they probably change a little bit here and there too, so it's nice to have that ability to to adjust, right? Yeah, you can. You'll be able to. They'll be in a Word document, um, and then uh, basically you can take and use whatever you want. Um, if your standards are a little bit different in your state, you'll mm -hmm. still have some really good stuff because we've really been working hard on math and graphing. Uh, it's been we've seen more and more of that during our standardized tests, okay. so we're trying to embed that in in some of the task cards. Okay, great, um, and that kind of touches on a little bit about the, you know, common core is something that we hear a whole lot about right now. Um, and is that something that just kind of is addressed with what you're doing already, or are there any um, other efforts or delving into those standards to address common core specifically? Uh, that's a great question. We are one of the rogue states. Uh, Virginia is not is a non-common core state. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so we don't do anything with Common Core, to be honest, but I think in, in general terms, um, Common Core is just a, a nationwide standard. Um, and so in anything that you're doing to take that, if you're in a Common Core state, anytime you can touch and in, tap into that vocabulary, and anything that you do is going to help support what the students need to know for their standardized tests. Right, and even some of the reinforcement you mentioned where, you know, asking them about some of those content areas, you know, see if they can, you know, if they can if they can speak about those things. I mean, that's a reinforcement that's, you know, in a lot of the Common Core standards where how can kids articulate certain ways or certain concepts. So it definitely can fit. Um, with Absolutely. Um, question about, do you have experience teaching middle school, Chad? Uh, no, I don't have formal experience at the middle school level. Okay, okay. Um, all right, let's see. We're kind of getting to the end of some of our questions here. Um, let me just go through here. I think we've gotten to pretty much everything. We'll let a uh, few questions. If there's some other questions people have. We'll, we'll let them kind of trickle in here as we um, cover a few other um items about next month's webinar, and we also want to announce the winner of our, our giveaway, our um, academic parachute. Um, so just a reminder for our webinars, they occur the third week of every month or close to it. Um, we will send out announcements of our next webinar topic here shortly. Everybody who is registered and on this webinar will receive a certificate of participation for an hour of educational credit. And uh, you will also be notified of the PowerPoint um, on our website so that you can go back and, and take a look at it. Um, and the winner of our well, – hold on before I announce that. I think we've got um, one more question here for you, Chad. <clears> the <throat> question is, do you incorporate math, science, or social studies concepts in each one of your classes? Um, I think what the the question is getting at is, um, you know, do you cover a variety of topics within your classes, or do you stick to one topic for each lesson, or is it just kind of the way, you know, it depends on the lesson? It really depends on the lesson. Uh, what I have found is that the, the easiest ones to integrate um, on a regular basis um, uh, is, is math. Math is very easy to integrate. Um, and English language arts and science, depending on what they're doing, um, can be easier or hard. You know, um, it, it just – it really takes kind of playing with it a little bit and experimenting with it to see, see what works the best. Again, I do a lot of the integration during my warm-up activities because I don't feel like that's um, taking away from my core content. But I do believe that it's um, – that I try to target what I know that the classroom the, – the areas that the kids are having the most trouble in. 
Um, you know, we can go and disaggregate data and look across the entire school division or across my entire school in the fifth grade and say that, you know, they don't have, uh, they need work on fractions. So then I do fraction task cards with the kids where they put them on a number line and they have to order them or they have to, you know, um, match things up with graphics, whether a, 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 a shape is congruent or non-congruent. It's, I go, we dive in to figure out what they're going to need the most help with and try to target those things. Good, good. Well, let's announce the winner of our Active Academics Cross-Curricular Shoot. The winner is Katie Thornburg of New Hanover County Schools. PE teacher there, so we'll get that sent out right away. Again, uh, just a reminder to everybody, uh, announcements of the next webinar will be coming out shortly and the information on your certificate of participation. I want to thank you, Chad, for your presentation. Um, good stuff as always, and we hope to see all of you back here at a webinar again next month. Thank you.